quite nice um, to give the full um, attention to Professor Pamas, um, who is with us today to talk about this important um, aspect. And uh, another thing, maybe a technical one, um, there will be like a uh, yeah, lecture um, of about 20 to 30 minutes and afterwards a lot of time for discussion. And this is what we want. We want to discuss with you, we want to give you the opportunity uh, to talk. And uh, yeah, that's uh, the thing we would like. And uh, yeah, we hope um, to have a nice day until six o'clock. Okay, then maybe for uh, the presentation, um, I just uh, give you some insight of the work of uh, Professor Tamas, and afterwards he will present um, some thoughts of our topic. So Professor Tamas graduated from Babish um, Reali University in 1972. He originally has studied philosophy and classics. Um, after a stint as an assistant of um, or assistant editor of Literally Weekly in his native Transylvania, so that's in Romania, uh, he got into political difficulties with the authorities of the time and immigrated then to Hungary, uh, where he taught at the University of Budapest. Um, sacked for political reasons, again, he became known as a dissident intellectual and published only in the underground or abroad. And uh, then um, he was elected as a liberal member of the Hungarian parliament in 1989. Uh, he quit professional politics in 1994 and was then the head of the Institute of Philosophy at the Hungary Hungarian Academy and has taught in Columbia, Oxford, Chicago, Georgetown, Yale and other universities and was a visiting research fellow in Paris, Vienna, Washington DC and Berlin. Um, he was recently granted, uh, or he was granted uh, the Life Achievement Award uh, of the Soros Foundation in Hungary and published books on uh, political philosophy and social theory and has his works uh, been translated in more than 12 um, languages. And now he's here for us to talk about the rise of populism and uh, that this is the point where I would hand over to him. And yeah. Um, wish all of us a nice, pleasant um, afternoon and a good discussion about this really important topic. And maybe one note, if you have like technical understanding problems, so there's a word you don't know or uh, like uh, another, um, like a concept you don't know about, just give us a sign that we can maybe explain it a little bit more because uh, we think it's very important uh, to, that everybody is on the same page and on the same side what we are talking about. And uh, yeah, with this, I would hand over. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you for having me. And I have decided that today I will try to be as clear and simple as I can and because the topics that are in discussion today are too important to be played with. If you think about politics, there's obviously two major ways in which you can conceive of a politics that serves the interest of possibly everybody and that is capable of conjuring up a good society, about which more later. Two methods. One is that you will ask the interested people, you'll ask the citizens, what kind of a society they would like to live in, what would be the kind of government they would be willing to obey, at least temporarily, uh, what kind of laws will they approve of, and by consulting public opinion, by consulting the citizens, by trying to find a compromise between them, with various methods, among which the best known is elections, 
You'll ask them, and those who will subscribe in a greater number to an opinion will win. Their point of view will win. The most numerous current of opinion will be dominant in society. That's one method. That's one method by comparing competing opinions about the good society, about the good state, about good laws, about liberty and such important things in our lives. But then, of course, we know, and many people have known before us, that this method is highly imperfect. Even if there is no fraud, there is no cheating, even then, in the best of circumstances, opinions can be erroneous. Even majorities can be wrong, and uh, not to speak of irresponsible and selfish groups within the ruling class that will try to induce people into error, to uh, convince them to believe in opinions that are in fact advantageous not to themselves, but to the ruling groups in a given society. But even if you disregard the possibility of cheating, as I said, error is always possible because our knowledge is always imperfect. Okay, so therefore, we can in politics err with the best of intentions because of the limitations of our knowledge and because of imperfection of our morality and our intellectual capacities and our psychology. That's easy to understand. So the other method would be then not to consult uh, people who are just simple citizens and don't have a specialized knowledge in law, in jurisprudence, in politics, in public administration, in uh, urban planning, in environment, etc., etc. But you will consult the experts. You will consult the people in the know. This is what Plato called uh, the domination of the philosopher kings. In a good society, he said, and many others after him, the people who know the truth, who have a deep, who have a profound knowledge of the relevant matters, should govern not the ignorance, not the people who are easy to mislead because of their intellectual uh, and psychological and social and cultural limitations. So let's turn, turn to the best and follow them. How will you know who are the best? You know? How will you select, how will a community, how will a community decide who to trust? How will it establish what the correct method of knowledge is, according to which a good society should be governed? There are various ways in which you can argue for this. For example, you can establish a kind of science that is always correct. It has been believed for a long time, that a science based on the precision, on the exactitude, on the uh, non-contradictory character of mathematics would be correct. We could control with mathematical methods and logical methods whether the doctrines proposed to citizens according to which they will be governed are erroneous or not. We can use scientific methods by comparing the doctrines to empirical reality, to outside reality that you are experiencing, and also you can logically control these doctrines, whether they are correct, not self-contradictory, they are not making logical mistakes, and are not foolish or biased or whatever. Very well, uh, there has been, and there have been such governances, most especially uh, in systems which were governed by theologians. The political rule of the churches was one model of this kind of governance in which there was even uh, an other proof of the truth that would uh, direct the steps of the governance, 
namely that the truth was divinely inspired, was guaranteed by the Godhead, was guaranteed by supernatural knowledge that was superior to purely human knowledge. There was a supernatural guarantee. So the church, divinely inspired, was supposed to be able to exercise or at least to inspire correct kind, just kind of govern governance. All these models, to put it very shortly, all these models, the one you can call uh, democratic, a democratic model, you know, democratic in the Greek, in the ancient Greek sense of the word, not in the contemporary sense of the word, the democratic method by including citizens in their own government, self-government in a way, uh, and I'll tell you a few words about that, why our contemporary liberal democracies are not democratic. And the other method, and the other method was, of course, there are systems of intellectual governance, of governance based on truth rather than on agreement. There's a great difference. Both have resulted in terrible tyrannies. Both have resulted in total disaster, repeatedly in history. We know that all the guarantees that have been offered, first by inclusion, by participation, by uh, this is collective decision-making, the democratic way, or the theological or philosophical or scientific way of governance, have uniformly failed. That was something that already, you know, 2,400 years ago has been formulated that uniformly every system of governments in the end fails because of its specific weaknesses. Now, let me refine this very, child, if you wish, childish and simplistic image of the tragedy of politics. First, if you are talking about democracy, democracy as a great French thinker, Jacques Rancière, uh, has uh, described it, is basically not a real political system. Because democracy aims at something that we never seem to have in any state, namely absence of power. Let me explain. What did the Greeks in the Greek city-states do when they recognized a social and political system as democratic? First, the conditions were extremely demanding and hard in order for a system to be recognized as democratic. A, all those who decided had to be full citizens. Who are full citizens? Full citizens are those who don't depend on anybody, who are totally free in taking decisions. Nobody who works for someone else can be such a person. Anybody who has to work is not a citizen. All communists will agree with this. The abolition of work is a precondition of freedom. If you work, you are technologically and personally and economically subordinated to somebody whom you work for. Your interests are either in conflict or are subservient to the interest of your employer. Anyway, it depends in a hostile or positive manner of them. This was called, uh, in Greek, banausia. That was a condition whereby people had to earn their bread themselves. They couldn't do what they wanted. They had to work for a living. Such people are not free, so they can't decide. Secondly, these people will have to be so filled with a sense of duty, they should prepare to send their whole life in deciding the affairs of the community, both by participating in the assembly, talking about public affairs, 
because no democracy will have fixed laws. Democracy will always express the will of the community, the intentions of people, and any written law will reduce their liberty in the name of people who lived before. Any rule of law, any Rechtsstaat, as the Germans say, is the rule of the dead. And democracy is the rule of the living, of those who live in the moment, who live now, who decide now. Every democratic community has to be always present and living and decide again and again and again at every moment. Otherwise, our freedom is reduced. Otherwise, it will be somebody else who have decided in our stead, writing the laws and so on and so forth. And these people should be, people in the assembly, also the people who will fight for the republic, who will be soldiers. They won't hire others to fight for them. That won't be democratic. People who take the responsibility to rule will have to take the responsibility to fight for their rule and fight for, their, for what they believe to be true and just and good. Again, no leaders can be elected for a long time. No leaders can be named for a given time without the right of the community to call them back. No official elected can be paid for what he is doing. Because then, of course, he'll have an interest, a selfish interest in ruling. And the only interest that those republics recognized as legitimate for ruling was, of course, glory. In other words, the esteem of your compatriots. If you wanted any permanence in ruling, you were not a democrat. Well, I could go on, but I won't. Uh, judged by this standard, the contemporary electoral parliamentary democracies are no democracies at all. They are, in, in a way, the opposite of democracy, the democratic ideal, which means the constant debate and the constant competition between opinions, the constant common and mutual research of what is just and what is fair, and what is good and what is true, has to lack one thing, which is permanence, which is permanence, which is permanence. Democracy is, in other words, is no state. No state can be democratic. Any state of any kind that has some permanence, laws, you know, officials, public servants, etc., etc., cannot be democratic. Also, that means, of course, that democracies had to be aristocratic and had to be limited to small city-states. No great territorial state, which for logistical and logical and, 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 and practical reasons have to elect officials because the people are too numerous to gather and to decide things together, of course, that means if you have great territorial states, you won't have democracy. You can have democracy only in small communities. Any society beyond a small local community is not democratic. Hence, if no personal relationships, if no real contest between personalities will decide the correct way, then you have to connect the citizens in some way. How will you connect them? You will connect them through uniform procedures. Uniform procedures, say elections, say laws, say habits, say customs, say cultural prejudices, etc., etc., all those great regulative systems that bind people together who are not personally acquainted with one another. Hence, every state today aiming at some sort of decent governance has to combine decadent, decaying, second-rate elements of the two great models of the way in which we can conceive a just governance. Uh, a contest of opinions instead of research of truth as the basis of political decision-making. Well, look at any electoral contest today. What will these idiotic parties of today tell you usually? They won't tell you that 
what we are proposing to you is truth, unassailable result of a precise and 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 uh, 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 how to call it. Uh, notice that you can trust, okay? In other words, they, they won't make uh, uh, a claim that what they're saying is true. They will tell you that if you follow them, your life will be more pleasant, more acceptable, less dangerous, etc., etc., than the proposals of others. They will try, in other words, to appeal to your interests. But what are our interests? How are they defined? Who defines them? Are we really certain that what we regard as our own interests are really our own interests? We know perfectly well from our private lives that can be perfectly easily deceived about what is our best interest. Are we not sometimes selecting the worst kind of friends? Aren't we making mistakes in various decisions? Very frequently. How would, could, be sure, could we be sure that we are selecting our politically formulable interests with proper care and proper reasonableness and so on and so forth? There's no certainty about this. So the element of the impermanence and relativity of opinions remains, this uncertainty remains, but the sovereignty of the subject who decides it this way doesn't. That's absurd. That's an absurd system that is absolutely sure to be unjust and unfair. If interests are not defined in any clear and honest way, it's impossible conceptually and intellectually to discover what the true interests are. We can deceive ourselves and we most certainly will. So our choices will be totally arbitrary, hence unfree. No decision that is not based on proper knowledge can be called free. Caprice, whim, is not freedom. Okay, so and then, you know, then, uh, then the contemporary uh, states, the best of them even, you know, then will tell you that it is the rule of law that binds us together and is the outside framework within which a less, more or less decent life, at least secure life can be lived, where you won't be arbitrarily attacked and deported and beheaded and tortured and whatever. Rule will reign supreme and save you from the worst. Okay, okay. But how can this be reconcilable with the so-called democratic character and liberal character of these societies? Who are the guardians of law? They are unelected officials called judges. That again is an old problem. You know, constitutional courts and supreme courts will tell your elected representatives whether they can make this law or not. Hence, there is an authority. There is a force above the elected officials. So there is a deep contradiction within the state. So it is small, and again I could go on and on and on about the internal contradictions of any state you are acquainted with. There are many more, of course. And, but I hope I have shown to you that when our community is addressing the dangers that are threatening our societies, it is not on a solid ground. We may say that we will support our democratic societies, etc., etc., in uh, the face of the fascist danger. I don't like the term populist. Let's simplify. Let's call them fascists. Okay? It's a clearer term, although it's exaggerated to a certain extent, because, of course, the fascists of today are not as awful as the fascists of yesterday, because they don't need to. But that's, okay, that's, that's a different topic. Okay, so uh, it's easier with us than it has been before. You know what's the difference? The difference is that in 1933, there was a strong socialist movement. 
there were huge socialist mass parties that in principle could have resisted. They didn't in the end, for various reasons, with a few exceptions in Spain and in Austria, but, uh, but, but, but the fascists of, of, of the 20th century had to address strong enemies. Such strong enemies don't exist at the moment. Okay, but that's, that's in brackets. What is important? So, we defend, allegedly, we defend our uh, liberal democratic societies and rule of law states and such and such, in spite of the populist or whatever, extreme nationalist or this and that danger. And we are not standing on a solid ground, as I said. But the enemies of these societies, the enemies of societies that want to make them definitely worse than they are now, and I'll explain why do I think that, they know perfectly well too that we are not standing on a solid ground. So they have a point. And that's the greatest danger. When the enemies who want to destroy what is really worth some respect in contemporary society have a valid point against us. If us means everybody from moderate conservatives to Marxists, say. This is us against them. Okay. But of course, again, this us and them is very shaky and not really true. But okay, let's for a moment suppose that this is so. What are the points the extreme right is raising legitimately and uh, intelligently sometimes against the present order of things? A, that the present order of things doesn't really represent the people's will. That is, of course, true. It won't be a problem if our mixed system wouldn't refer to the people's will as if it was expressing the people's will, which, of course, it isn't. Nor could it. It is impossible. By this indirect rule system, the people's will cannot be formulated in any reasonable way so as to be expressed politically. The people's will is an invention. It is an abstraction that doesn't exist. We can imagine the people's will directly expressed, but that, of course, in the present order of things is impossible. Nobody has seen the people's will. Nobody knows what the people's will would be if we were really free if we weren't bound by laws, by violence, by coercion, by state, by taxes, by prejudice, by compulsion to work, etc., etc., what will then be the people's will? We don't know. Nobody knows. Hence, anybody who says that they know for some intuitive, intuitive mean, meaning based on feeling, uh, some intuitive way they know what the people's will is, they have a point, because the people's will is not represented. The fact that it cannot be represented in a modern capitalist society and in a so-called liberal democracy, that's another thing. But we are, of course, missing this, because we, all of us, we know perfectly well that the world is not so as we, in our heart, would desire. There is, this is called alienation. We are strangers to the order we are putting up with. We must live in this way because the outside world is too strong and any single person is too weak to resist on his or her own. <coughs> but we all feel that things, even if they are acceptable sometimes, most certainly cannot be satisfactory for everybody. That is, won't express the people's will, because the people's will could be expressed only after a deep transformation of present-day society that would make it possible to be expressed and before being expressed to be conceived. Okay, so when the IFD and similar parties and the Bolsonaros and the Narendra Modis and the Dutertes and the, all this, and the Orbans of this world will tell you that I know better than all those dusty, cold documents and constitutions will tell you what you need. 
namely to be yourself and to kick everybody else. That's the basic idea. They have a point. They have a point. They have a point because we are missing something which they fraudulently and falsely but to draw our attention to that we are dissatisfied and it is the system that stands between us and the authentic expression of ourselves. That's true. How they want to solve this, of course, is a lie. But that doesn't mean that what they say doesn't resonate with lots of our compatriots and not, for, not necessarily for the worst of reasons. So, uh, so what are these new forces winning everywhere telling uh, the members of our societies? Something that has been said before, it is basically, if you listen very carefully to these people, it is very much akin to what ruling classes have been always saying, which is the following. You may think that the lower classes have interests visibly distinct from the interests of the upper classes. You think that the haves have different interests from the have-nots. You think that the citizens of poor countries have the same interests as the citizens of rich countries. You think that exploiters and exploited, uh, insiders and outsiders, oppressors and oppressed, strong and weak, uh, ill and well, etc., etc., will have the same interests. How do you prove this? Because that's, of course, if that would be the case, if everybody had a common interest, and that common interest only has to be administered by the powers that be, everything will be hunky-dory, everything will be okay. How do they prove this? Very simply. Now, there are aspects that are non-political and non-economic in which we are all alike and all the same. And this is race. And this is race, or some synonym of race. Ethnicity, nationhood, identity, culture, name it as you wish. It comes back to the same idea. That there is a dimension in the members of society in which they are all alike, more than alike, in which they are one. And in which they are united against others be those others defined as you wish. That varies. And that community between people of different interests, different class uh, belonging, different identities, regional, etc., 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 different political positions, you know, there are people who are, have no political power whatsoever, and for various reasons, in some societies even legally, they are robbed of exercise of the political power, in other societies they are not. Nevertheless, there are very few people who really do exercise political power. And we are told that we are all the same, and we are opposed to the foreigner. Again, the foreigner in this political propaganda comes in many guises. It can be the foreigner as the citizen of a foreign country. But even more insidiously, it can come from people in your midst who in some ways are serving some foreign interest, some supranational interest, some international interest, or some selfish interest for a small elite influential group uh, of a minority that has a hidden agenda against the majority. Okay, that's a very old. That's a very old. That's very old talk, and is now repeated in a slightly different manner. What is the difference? What is new? These people are representing the most powerful elements in any given society, and they are denying their power. It is people like Trump, say, uh, a millionaire. Uh, probably the citizen in the world that has the greatest political power in his own hands, 
will say that he is opposed by the elite. What is the elite? The elite, in its normal definition, is the chosen, is the most excellent elements in a society recognized as such. So, the strongest and the most famous person in the world will talk about people who are much weaker, much less famous and much less rich as himself, as though they were his powerful and successful enemies. In what sense? In the sense, he says, and these people all say, there's an elite of people like myself, you know, leftish intellectuals and so on, who are in a way trying and sometimes succeeding to define what I would call the moral consciousness of the age. That, for example, demands and ideas such as an interdiction of discrimination against ethnic groups, against classes, against genders, against races, against colors, against religious creeds, etc. This is a false idea represented by people like leftist intellectuals who have a hidden agenda. What is their hidden agenda? To take away the leading role from the healthy, traditional leading element in any given society. And those are, of course, the white, uh, Christian, rich, secularized, Western men of the upper classes that have been exercising, indeed, they have been exercising the rule for millennia. And they say to us that the uh, testimony of history is that the traditional leading element in society, represented by the traditional ruling classes, by the state, by jurisprudence, uh, by the churches, are traditionally called by destiny or by divinity to rule, and they prove their superiority for years, this is something called tradition. Okay? And people such as myself and others will try to undermine tradition and under the pretext of equality and of liberation and of freedom from discrimination to create a rule all of their own that is the rule of doctrinaire intellectual bureaucrats that will determine for you if you don't if you are not very careful, uh, how to live well, how to live morally, how to live honestly, how to decide difficult conflicts in a way that is subordinate only to universal moral and philosophical criteria. So therefore, the most powerful men on earth are pretending that they are leading a rebellion. They're leading a rebellion which has always been the birthright of the weak. We have been always weak, we have been always few, we have always been beaten down, but at least we stage some nice revolts every now and then. So now even this privilege of starting revolutions is confiscated by the uh, uh, leading element, and they are telling us that they are defending privilege and the difference and tradition and experience against doctrines of equality and of justice and of liberation and against mysterious, strong forces in the world that uh, are preaching liberty to people who need firm, leading hands. Okay? And uh, the basis for such doctrines that are now being preached by these new uh, reactionary forces has always been based, always been based on race and gender. Thousands of years before, how was, for example, the old nobility defined? 
Have you heard of the doctrine of the blue blood? Blue blood of the aristocrats meant that they were racially different, superior to the rest. This is how castes in India have been defined, that they were biologically, by birthright, from different origins, etc., etc. The darker hue, the darker skin was always defined as a mark, as a badge of servitude by white societies, of course, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Because why? For various historical reasons, but there's one thing too, because it appeared, this difference, you know, appeared as natural, not as historical, not as social, not as moral. What are the Trumps, etc., etc., of this world telling us? We are just recognizing what is natural. We represent nature. But that has always been the difference between left and right. The right always said that it's representing nature, and the left has always said that it was representing history. Okay? That was always the case, and it's still the case, and it will always be the case. For the very simple reason, not because that is conceptually necessary, but the very simple reason that privilege and prejudice and inequality cannot be argued for in other terms than in terms of natural determination. Because nobody can pretend that it's morally attractive or acceptable if you look at the social problem from a logical and rational way. We know that human beings are about the same kind. We know that there are no such huge natural differences between different categories of people as to warrant different orders of rights, of excellence, of pleasure, of freedom between them. Everybody knows that. Everybody, everybody has seen children growing. Everybody has seen little babies who couldn't talk, and we all have been babies who didn't talk, and now we can talk indeed, and we do. And we know that natural differences are gradual and relative. Therefore, there cannot be any rational order that at least cannot be criticized on the basis of the primordial similitude of human beings. So, therefore, the right is not telling us that this is morally acceptable. They will say, we are on the side of experience of tradition, and we don't pretend that rule and governing can be offered to anybody. The fear of the outsider that might gain power is one of the most effective weapons of the ruling classes of ever, right? So what we are facing is nothing very new. Is nothing very new. We are being offered ideologies of natural superiority and of uh, uh, various myths of mysterious forces being uh, 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 willing to change the world in the sense of more liberty and more equality. This has been uh, exercised for millennia. The difference now is that we are living in a world that fraudulently and mendaciously is pretending that is actually based on the principles of freedom and equality, while it isn't. Hence the critics are right when they are accusing the present order of hypocrisy. Yes, it is hypocritical. It is not free. It is not equal. It is not democratic. It is not able to ensure the expression of the true desires of people. Of course not. And that's also a very old thing. To emphasize the hypocrisy of a mixed, of a very, very, very foldable and weak and decadent order to promise a firestorm 
of violence and terror and coercion and injustice and heroism and war, cleansing storm that will get rid of hypocrisy, that will get of duplicity, but also it will get rid of the safety of everybody of you as private persons. Because any rule based on race <coughs> and on masculine superiority is an order in which the number of dangers is increasing. So, for us, the problem, which I'm asking you to decide, we'll have, we're having a discussion if you are still have force to do it, should we, in the face of a very vulgar and malevolent and uh, uh, dangerous attack, should we defend an order that is hypocritical, that is mendacious, that is unjust, that is unfair, that it, that it does nothing of all the things it pretends to be doing. So shall we defend a shallow, self-contradictory, weak lie only because we are afraid of something much worse? Because this is how the conflict is presented. In a few days, we'll have the European elections. The powers of the insiders at the moment, of the main governments of Germany and other European countries too, will say that, yes, let's defend the present mild form of injustice to prevent an aggressive and open and ugly version of injustice. Is that a choice that is decisive enough, that is inspiring enough, that will satisfy the moral discontent that we're feeling? I very much doubt it, but I would be very curious to find out what you think about it. And let me thank you for your patience. Thank you. Uh, am I on? Yeah. So thank you very much um, for this um, yeah, inspiring talk. Uh, I think um, we uh, yeah will be uh, like um, having some questions from the audience. Uh, I see there's uh, um, the microphones preparing. Um, maybe maybe some one thing, uh, one question from my side beforehand. Um, you now explained what. Um, is the problem a little bit in your opinion? Um, is there anything like you uh, say you see where some outcome where uh, yeah it will get better? Is there any like utopia that um, as you as presented? Well, of course, uh, you know, with a little imagination and a little will for creating texts and proposals and so on and so forth, you can always think of a solution in the abstract sense. Yes, I can imagine very easily, I'm one of those that quite numerous actually, who can put together a system of preferences about a situation in which their moral exigences and their ideas about what could be better for the fellow human beings could be comprised. Yes, that's not, so, that's not so complicated. It can be done. But what I would be more interested in is that can we at least, and, and in this I'm hesitant. This is why I'm not pretending. If I had a clear political platform to propose to you, uh, I wouldn't have hidden it. I would have been, of course, cautious because it's a university and not a political meeting, but I could have expressed it indirectly uh, and more clearly than I did. But because I'm hesitant, because you see, as I said in a very simplistic manner at the beginning, simplistic but important uh, things were those. Uh, how would we discover the true reasons for change? 
Because simple dissatisfaction is just an opinion like any other. It can be very bad for you, you know, and this amount of dissatisfaction, alienation, and indeed political unhappiness that we are experiencing, we can see that it harms people. Obviously, yes. So you know, the, the general mood is awful, and in, in many very different countries. Uh, but, but this, however, however widespread, and however much I feel very well motivated, uh, it's still an opinion. We all might be wrong. And in fact, things maybe are perfectly well, and we don't know. We are, we are not grateful enough or whatever. But, so it would be important to have a solider ground than we do have at the moment. How do we discover them? There are theoretical and social scientific and philosophical methods that promise, some more successfully than others, how do you discover these things. But that is open that way. Economic, social, cultural analysis is open to a number of professionals only. Because those people who should decide, in fact, are busy. Are busy earning their life. Are busy doing whatever is needed to stay alive in such a society. Again, that's an eternal problem. Again, nothing new. But, so how? So that would, for example, show why were some of our socialist forebears right when they raised the organization problem as the most important one? Because they wanted to create at least the social framework in which at least a number of dissatisfied and rebellious people, at least those, could decide in a rational manner what to do. If we don't have a rationally well-grounded and morally motivated community that is willing to talk and to listen, then raising problems itself is irrational. It's just talk. It's just talk. I'm, I have nothing against talking. I'm a teacher and I'm a writer, so my job, of course, is talking. But when I say just talk, then I hope that what I'm doing is not just talk. It's talk, but not just talk. What's the difference? That I am, as a, by necessity, lonely thinker, I am in the business also of looking for a community. For looking for a community of the future. This future might come tomorrow. Uh, that might be able to search for truth, search for justice, and do something for this to be the basis of its own praxis, in which the words about politics, about the common good, have their weight, you know? And that, so, so, that's, so this is why I cannot give a direct answer. Yes, my utopia would be would be a good community of people who try to work out the necessary concepts that would make it possible in a better society than ours to express our wishes without cheating and without deceiving ourselves. Sorry for the long answer, but that's the true answer. So, and with this, I would open um, like with questions, but you can also make statements. So uh, it would be uh, really also quite cool to get your ideas uh, also on the talk, maybe also uh, on uh, the whole topic of um, rising populism um, that you maybe also experienced, like uh, also can give us examples. We have like uh, one hour of time. And yeah, so um, I would uh, give the mic free at that place. Yeah. 
Um, hello, my name is Anna, uh, and I actually study in Budapest in Alte, but I'm from Ukraine, and I lived in Budapest for a year right now, I think, and what I have noticed, there are a lot of controversial policies that uh, Viktor Orban is doing right now uh, in regards to CEU and actually to migrants. And uh, with the new elections coming up, I think his party was kicked out of the European Parliament, but I think they're going to run again. And what do you think, what are the chances? Because I think there are also problem with populism in Italy right now. Do you think they have a big chances of actually getting to the European Parliament politics or like for, into, into the EU? And how, how do you think they can be influential in the upcoming years? Thank you. Uh, very briefly, uh, they haven't been kicked out from European Parliament only from their own conservative group in the in the European Parliament. But that's that's a detail. Uh, I've seen the latest polls this morning. Uh, Mr. Orbán's party will uh, win hugely in the European elections. Uh, it will send 13 MEPs to Brussels, while the Socialist Party will send two. And uh, yes, he'll win in a big way. So will so will uh, Signor Salvini, and so will be a number of other questionable characters. Uh, yes, and you know, Viktor Orban, of course, an example I know best, being also Hungarian. Of course, I know him very well personally too. But that's that's a side issue, and uh, so that will illustrate to you what a system that is called populist is like. Because a populist system is at least supposed to be, at least in some respects, useful to the populace. No, to the, to the lower, who are the populace? Everybody minus the aristocracy. And uh, this is a country in which, indeed, you have lost all major modern freedoms, especially the freedom of the media, freedom of the press, uh, freedom of education and others. But also it's a country in which you have a flat tax of 15 that advantages the rich, in which you don't have a real company tax, in which you don't have a fortune tax, in which you don't have a uh, house tax, property tax, landed property, and so on. It is one of the most unequal societies in Europe while maintaining that is fighting against the uh, elites, especially the foreign elites, a state in which the German car companies don't pay taxes, but they get actually government subsidies from the poor Hungarian state, goes to the rich German car companies, uh, actually, in this very nationalist country, who are the ones who are really uh, commanding? There was a joke in Hungarian newspaper saying that uh, there were you know, three words in which Europe responds to Viktor Orban and Hungarian politics. BMW, Mercedes and Audi. These are the, these are the three words. And so, you know, it's, it's a system that is extremely unfair extremely unjust, extremely unfree, even compared to the common run of European countries, but that uh, pretends to liberate itself and everybody from the yoke of themselves, actually. And, and, but because of the uh, pervasive racism and chauvinism that are widespread, but of course not voluntarily and automatically uh, originated elements are very strong in Hungary. You know, the non-existent threat of the refugees, because there are no refugees in Hungary, is uh, paramount as a propaganda element. But you see how these things are poisoning everything. The government's propaganda against uh, uh, immigrants and refugees from the Middle East and from Africa and from Central Asia are countered by some opposition parties and making propaganda against Ukrainian guest workers. So, yes, the political situation is as bad as you can just describe it. Not violent, because there's no resistance. 
um, you mentioned uh, like uh, the economy um, or uh, like uh, the difference um, in income. Is this something like a prerequisite for uh, like having a populist system um, or something that enhances um, the possibilities of it? You know, the, uh, in Western Europe, in the last 30 years, the average salaries haven't increased. The last time when, when, when a decrease in, in income inequality happened was under the welfare state, and that is in the distant past. Nobody, nobody is really promising I mean, nobody with chances of success is promising any egalitarian redistribution, that is, the redistribution of incomes and various assets towards the poor, to enrich the poor and make the rich a little poorer, and the poor a little richer. So in this, in this direction, there are no policies. The populists are not uh, uh, proposing anything like that. In some places, yes. But, but that's very rare. And so what we have here is a movement of the extreme right, calling it populist, has only one conceivable political aim, to uh, dissolve propagandistically the difference between left and right. That's what the term is serving. They talk about left populism and about right populism, while the two have nothing in common And the term is an abuse itself. But that's a word people are using, so I'm not protesting too much. But uh, so that's why. So if you call, say, Bernie Sanders populist, you call Jeremy Corbyn populist, of course, these, these are very traditional social democratic leaders. They have absolutely nothing populist in them, uh, not a populist bone in their body. They are very traditional social democrats who would like you know, to raise taxes for the rich and to, 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 to get more employment op opportunities to the working class and, you know, correct the usual thing that social democratic governments are correcting, health, education, um, public transport, etc., etc. And no, populist leaders are not doing anything of the kind. Populist leaders are doing exactly what Trump is doing, uh, forbidding immigration, conducting commercial wars against foreign countries, thereby increasing the danger of war, and by uh, giving anti-black hints to his audience that has rehabilitated anti-black racism in the United States, where it always existed, but the political governing classes have frowned upon it for a long time. And now again it's permissible, again it's accepted. Again you can talk about blacks and other ethnic minorities in a way in which only in my childhood it was, it was customary to be talked about that. So, but, but no, these movements are strongly anti-egalitarian in all respects. But at the same time as I said, they're trying to emphasize that they are opposed to the intellectuals, to the university and to the media people who in their view are preaching impossible utopias and self-serving agendas of the leftist kind. But that of course is not the ruling class. And egalitarianism that is directed against a few university teachers and a few columnists in the newspapers, that seems to me as an egalitarian thrust Pretty ridiculous. Okay, then uh, next questions. Um, we yeah, first go there. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ibrahim El Damfa from the Gambia, uh, Africa. I think uh, the discussion is kind of much centered outside Africa, but I would want to give a. Uh, uh, my opinion in terms of uh, populism uh, and its relation to Africa. I think I am scared if populism should be in rise in Africa, because in Africa right now, 
especially in countries around West Africa, we have a problem of nationalism, liberalism, and infrastructuralism. Uh, I want to believe that if we in any way want to introduce or kind of uh, uh, kind of bring about the concept of popularism in, the, in, the, in, in our countries will be kind of uh, introducing or enforcing the concepts of tribalism. Because nowadays in Africa, elections is just a typical tribal census, whereby a group of people will pretend like they have the interests of the people at heart, but at the end of the day, convert themselves with the majority of uh, tribal or ethnic groups in order to earn votes. And this is working very well for them. And uh, as a young politician in my country, I would also want to ask, uh, in what way do you think Africa and Africans can uh, move from any kind of electing people based on a specific line, which is tribal, which is religious, or which is anything that is related to them, to electing people who have the skills, who have the abilities, who have the experience, who have the interests of the, the continent or the particular country at heart in order to move the con uh, our, our continent. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And if I may say a personal word, I grew up as a member of a minority group. I, I'm a Hungarian from Romania, basically. I grew up in Romania. I lived there for 30 years <clears throat> before I was forced to leave, first to Hungary and then to the West and so on and so forth. So I can see very well. I've seen many nationalist uh, Romanian leaders uh, who were uh, saying worrying things at first in the radio, and then making uh, 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 scary measures against the ethnic group I belonged to, which is not to mean that the Hungarians, when they were in a majority in the 19th century, weren't behaving very badly against what was then the Romanian minority. These things keep being repeated by various groups, as you know very well, better than I do. The only thing you can do of course, it will be slow, maybe slower than it should be, is to found political organizations that are strictly non-ethnic in character, that are based on your democratic principles and in which members and activists voluntarily will give up the old habit of trying to uh, uh, advance the cause only of their tribe, of their ethnic group, etc., etc. So you have to begin very humbly at the at the beginning, at, at at the bottom, with people who have, which is not easy, which is not easy, have discarded their own ethnic prejudices, and there have been such political parties in the past, and they failed, unfortunately. The most famous case, of course, is what happened in this country in August 1914, when the Internationalist Socialist Party, from one day to another, had become, well, of course, it, they were in precedence, and they were, but seemingly from one day to another, have been transformed from the Internationalist Party into a Nationalist Party, from a party of peace into a party of war. So this is one of the most difficult, this is one of the most difficult tasks in human endeavor in modern societies <clears throat> to base political organization and even more political success in voluntarily relinquishing ethnic and gender prejudice. But you must try, there's no other hope. You may not succeed, but I cannot see any other hope at all. So, luck to you. Okay, then I would give um, for this phone. Yeah, you uh, decide where. Hmm? Um, uh, um, yeah. So, hi. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm Rina from the Philippines. Um, I think this topic is really relevant to my country right now too, just like the rest of the world. Um, 
But when you're talking about the rise of populism in the West and most countries, it's always based on race and ethnicity. But I think one thing that differs in my country is that it's a struggle within class. So the war of drugs or war against drugs of Duterte has been targeting the poor in our country. And I want to get your insight, like how does this rise of um, populism in my country manage to get to this extent that bulk of our population actually supports it? Because it's based on um, his actions doing the right thing to help the citizens. And I think most Filipinos believe that. So I just want to get your insight on this. Thank you. So the Philippines. Do you know Sara Raimundo? Sara Raimundo, do you know? Sara Raimundo, well, that's a very, very interesting <coughs> uh, political activist and social thinker in the Philippines. Uh, uh, yeah, as a university professor. Anyway, uh, so I know, of course, very little of what I should know about such a great country. It's an important and large country. Uh, it should interest us uh, all. But in one respect, uh, it is still exemplifies the gen general characteristics of this new right-wing uh, breakthrough I tried to characterize, namely, that is insincere regarding the basic social fact of class. It presents itself as already Hitler did. Didn't Hitler call his party Socialist Workers' Party? Of course he did. <clears throat> you know, it's not new. Uh, so, forces purporting to represent the lower classes and the victims of injustice are necessary in the present position where the traditional ruling classes are not any longer trusted. So, they will be replaced by people like Duterte and people like Jokowi and people, like, you know, many people of this kind. They're not unique to Philippines or to Indonesia or to Brasilia. It's the same everywhere, you know. And in order to mobilize the poor against their own best interests. Well, that's the great trick. How do you get the people to be against itself? That's the great trick. And they are succeeding again and again and again. And we are sitting here in the Technische Universität von Ilmenau and, and kibitzing about it and talking about it. And we're still not doing anything against it, at least not anything effective, for the very simple reason that we have been making compromises for far too long, you know. Even I, I'm not innocent. If you would ask me, should you go to vote in the election for these imperfect, miserable parties of the so-called left? I would say, well, yeah, maybe go, please, because otherwise all these monsters will come in. Although I know that it doesn't help. But we are too much used to our bourgeois style compromises and we cannot look in the face the situation in which we actually do know that these so-called moderate forces won't help. Because they can't help. Not because they are demons, they are devils. Just what they want is ineffective because it is based on untruth. So. Yeah, people are indeed being deceived and being misled, and the rest of us are not doing our duty. Okay, then next one is up there. Yeah, um, thank you so much. I am Baba Waidabo from the Gambia. I fully comprehend your concept about democracy in relation to the topic of discussion. And that prompted me to ask this question. Uh, a country 
uh, that have been ruled by a dictator for almost two decades. And uh, the system of governance is uh, dictatorship. Uh, by that I mean where rule of law is not respected, where people's rights are not respected, uh, arbitrary arrests. Now, uh, what system of governance are you going to uh, recommend uh, for a country that has been ruled for two decades by a dictator? Thank you. Well, you know, it's, it's always, again, as you will know better than I do, but I suspect, and I know from historical examples, that this situation always entails a paradox. Because you see, if you can't get rid of, dicta of a dictator only by violent means, because basically that's the situation, it won't go away on its own, even if those violent means are not extremely violent means, but violent means, that also means that you are introducing some sort of revolutionary government. I'm not in principle opposed to a revolutionary government that is a government that is not elected, etc., etc., but is brought into power by a great movement on the streets and in the jungle or wherever it is. And, uh, but the question is, the danger is, again, we know from history, revolutionary governments tend to represent very passionately a truth, like you do, people's rights, etc., uh, with a great passion and great determination. A revolutionary government is usually unwilling to relinquish power because it has good reasons to suspect that the enemy is still there, that it's dangerous, that you should protect your people against those people who want to introduce dictatorship again. So therefore, revolutionary government can deteriorate too. And in a number of African countries, dictatorial government has come from genuine, true revolutions. That's a tragedy. They weren't just farces, they weren't just frauds. Some of those revolutions were genuine revolutions, most of them, and some of the true revolutionary leaders, think of Mugabe. You can't deny that he was a true revolutionary at the beginning. He was. He was always a pretty scary figure, but that's, that's, that's something different. And so there's always a danger in making revolution because thereby you may perpetuate a violent order of things. Also, there are situations where there's no other solution. When you have to try, because it is intolerable, because you can't, because it's morally intolerable to put up with such a thing again, and for a long time. So there are no, in other words, there are no permanent solutions to this. You must trust yourself to a certain extent. You must, you know, to use a Christian term, to examine your conscience. Am I still that innocent revolutionary that wants to liberate his, his or her fellow citizens? Or am I just a bitter man bent on revenge? It's not easy always to tell, because the two things are close to one another. Because, of course, revolutions are angry. This is why they are revolutionaries. And they have good reasons, very often, to be angry. It, but it is dangerous. But again, is not tolerating dictatorship even more dangerous? Is not indulging in these electoral games for decades dangerous because it rots the heart of society? Well, maybe in not violent ways, but in very, very uh, harmful, psychologically and pathologically very harmful ways. So there's no one true answer. It depends. And it depends, it depends mostly on, on, on morality. That's where you have to examine yourself and your friends and your allies more strictly than you examine your enemies. Sorry to sound so preachy and sounding like a stupid 
you know, pastor on the Sunday in a Lutheran church. But, you know, that's, that's my sincere opinion. Yeah, um, maybe following on this, because uh, maybe also the question beforehand was a little bit in this case. Okay, um, then he, yep, no one up there. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, for, uh, I've been a student of uh, uh, philosophy for a while now, and uh, I really enjoyed your lecture, sir. Uh, from, from what you have said, I think the rise of populism is a pre uh, precipitation of the moral foundations of our societies. I, I mean this by the idea that the best candidates should get the best position so that their uh, skills uh, can be utilized by her. Uh, I think the populists are especially unhappy with the process of deciding who is the best candidate. And uh, the, the populism, um, populism is a symptom of the present political system. If that is the case, uh, this is my question, if that is the case, is there a system better than the current political system that can both be moral and at the same time just? If there is, uh, how can we achieve this? Right, this is very, very, uh, I have a very short answer. I have a longer one, but there's no time for that. So you have to be content with my short answer. No, I cannot see any fair and just society around us. No. Uh, and, but that would be, that would be flippant. That would be superficial to say. That's true, but superficial. Because of course, there have been better societies than this, and especially there have been better political organizations and better political forces and better political than than they are today. So, you know, although I have many reservations vis-à-vis uh, -vis the welfare states of the 60s and the 70s. And also I have great doubts about a few uh, revolutionary governments that came into being in the 20th century. And I know that even if the good side would have won in Spain during the Civil War, it would not have been conducive to total happiness. Yeah, I'm perfectly aware of this. Nevertheless, these graduations, these degrees, are very important to be present in our minds. There are freer and less free societies. And the present, you are perfectly right in what you said, sir, about, about the reasons of, of this rise of the extreme right. Uh, there are reasons for that. There are the real dissatisfaction. And one of the real dissatisfaction is a very vague feeling of many people that not only there are concrete problems of various kinds, but these societies are also basically, profoundly unjust. And this is why people won't really support everything that smacks of hypocrisy. When you're conservative, liberal, prime minister, chancellor, or whatever, tells you that, okay, we are doing what we can, and things are on the whole quite decent. And people will turn their backs to this kind of talk, which offends their moral sense, that doesn't take into account the situation in which there is no real progress towards greater decency, greatest freedom, greatest authenticity, higher level of moral talk, a more a higher culture, and so on and so forth. So therefore, they would turn to all sorts of quack medicine, all sorts of false solutions that at least appear sincere. That is so important. That was also a factor in the rise of fascism in the 1920s and 1930s, it seemed to people that brutal talk was at the same time sincere. 
Well, we have, if we have learned anything from fascists, is that brutality and seeming sincerity and dispensing with good manners is not a true sign of truth. Okay, but that's a very small result. So, but, but this is exactly how Mr. Trump wins. Why does he seem authentic? Because he talks like the next idiot on the corner. He appears to be a man of the people. Not mannered like your television anchor man, not pretentious like your philosophy professor, etc., etc. You know, and he seems authentic, but he isn't. He's acting. This is a part he's acting, of course. It's a television production. Uh, you know, and so, of course, there's a lots of genuine and well reasoned dissatisfaction. And when people are instead of solving their problems, <clears throat> are trying to escape them when flying towards fraudulent, idiotic, malevolent, and mean kinds of movements that at least seem to mean what they say. Well, awful, really, but, but still there are differences, and uh, this period we are living, this age, is one of the worst. I was, to tell you the truth, I was a very isolated dissident in an East European society in the 1980s. We were a group, group of, say, 200 people in a country of 10 million. But, you know, I felt then, of course, and I was not completely right, but I felt then that at least I've joined the right cause. Even if we lose, even if we'll be imprisoned, thank God I wasn't, uh, at least we tried to be okay, to be just, to be fair. I was more at peace with myself than I am now, although it wasn't such a happy condition to be in, but I don't want to complain. I escaped, I'm here, so, you know. And uh, so, so, but this is worse. This is worse. Because this time... I'm not faced with a dictatorship of the few, but I'm faced with masses of my fellow human beings who are poisoned and who are thinking awful things, not seemingly forced by anybody to think like that. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not now the danger to me when I'm in a bus in Budapest. It's not a policeman, but other passengers. Okay, thank you. Um, then, yeah, it's up to your choice. Um, thank you so much for the lecture. I was actually very excited for this uh, lecture. Uh, my name is Putri, I'm from Indonesia. Uh, I was very excited for this lecture because just two nights ago we witnessed a riot happen in Jakarta because Jokowi won the election. Um, Coming to this, I found that your presentation, uh, what you what you shared to us was very interesting because it seems that you're suggesting that the democracy that we have right now is just a huge hypocritical lie, somewhat. P please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I got. Okay, so this is very thought provoking for me, and and it is very interesting actually, but also very. To me, it's sort of a very radical thought because uh, I'm studying international relations right now and all I've known is that democracy is um, what we need and what, what um, basically what we're having right now in Indonesia. Uh, but seeing what happened just two nights ago, I was thinking that, uh, just like you say, populism is not something new actually. It has happened over and over and over again. It's sort of a cycle. Um, so I was wondering, is there any actual um, middle path between the right and the left? Because uh, Indonesian scholars and academics in my campus uh, are trying to propose the idea of moderate politics, moderate Islamic politics. I'm studying in an Islamic university. So uh, do you, for me, I think this moderate politics is even more hypocritical. But uh, I'd like to know what you think of this. Thank you. 
Well, <coughs> let's be fair. Uh, in itself, being moderate is not a crime. Um, the question is, what is the middle road between which extremes? You know, in Indonesia, which had this tragical, tragic recent, recent, I mean, modern history, especially since '65, as we know. Uh, it has been indeed a country in which uh, people were preventing each other and preventing themselves from expressing what they really felt and thought. So, you know, terror went together with people's uh, inclination or propensity to bury the dead and forget all those awful things that had happened, which of course had delegitimized the left in Indonesia to an extent that maybe nowhere has been so 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 delegitimized. Yeah? You know, declaring in Indonesia that you're a communist, for example, you know, it's unthinkable. I know, I know, I know, I know, of course. That's a that's a well known fact. Of course, I've read my Benedict Anderson and all that stuff, you know. So and the thing is that uh, how do you get from A to B in a situation in which your language, even political language, is severely limited, severely curtailed. And this is partly imposed, partly voluntary. So it seems to be enormously difficult. And now again, the forces of order in Indonesia have a field day because they can show that too much democracy is bad for you because it leads to riots to violence to conflict etc etc so you know what you can do especially as somebody who's an academic yourself is the socratic method you must push the limits and ask questions and ask questions in this respect for example that how is it possible in a country with such fantastic resources, human and natural and political and historical and cultural, etc., etc., quite a place, okay? How is it possible that it was unable to build up an acceptable political commonwealth? What the hell is going on? Why not? Why not even at the level of comparable Asian countries that are imperfect but still have a lively political life I mean I would be the last person to praise India especially after this catastrophic electoral result but but still still it is lively and people don't seem to be afraid of themselves and so you know there in your Islamic University in your moderate Islamic University ask the moderates that what are the terms if they forget the fear of the communists, of the Islamic extremists, of the foreigners, of the Dutch, of the I don't know whom, uh, then what would they prefer? And how do you liberate them from this fear that is, seems to be very intensive in your culture? And if you manage to get some answers, and if you can lead people to some reasonable answers, then you have done your job. That's all I can propose, really. Um, maybe I come into this, um, how to overcome this fear, because this uh, seems to me like a core point of this populism uh, thingy. Well, you know, again, I'm trying to be fair. Uh, some of these fears the populists are invoking have real causes. For example, I am, uh, with many of you in this room, uh, quite active in various actions to help our brothers and sisters who are refugees. But this is not to say that the influx, massive influx of numerous foreign populations is without its dangers. Obviously, obviously there are such dangers. It would be a total lie to say that there are not. So, so fear can be legitimate. We are all afraid of the unknown, of the new, of the unusual, etc., etc. Perfectly well. We have always been children in the dark, 
and we know what, what it means to be afraid. It is human. Question is, what do you do with it? What do you do with it? So, you know, and I, I know, for example, you, that you, you, you would also, somebody active for the refugees who would never say that this doesn't create real problems. <coughs> So does any major social change I'm advocating. It may end badly. The question is, do you want forever to be at peace with the status quo, with the present situation as it is, because you are afraid that it might end even worse, or that you are taking a risk in the name of ideals you believe in? Uh, you know, and that is a question not of truth, but a question of judgment. There is a thinker I don't like very much, Hannah Arendt, whom I don't don't like very much. I mean, I admire her as a great writer, but I but I very rarely agree with her. But she was right in many important at many important points, and when she wrote about politics of being a matter of judgment, that is with intuitive uh, weighing of various possibilities and risks and so on. And this is why she considered one of the greatest sources of good political thinking, Kant's critique of judgment. And I learned that from her. And she was right. That's a great book of judging political problems, a great guide to judging political problems. And th there is no recipes. It's not a question of launch a revolution, found a party, start a reform, gather signatures, or turn your back, spend a few years passively because there's no hope at all, reasonable action. All these decisions are dependent on an intuitive, experiential intelligence that cannot be learned only by doing. You know, like, how do you, how do you learn to play the violin? Well, you know, it's not, not by reading a book. That's not, I, I played the violin, so I know. You, you know, you have to do it. You have to do it. And, and there are and lots of tricks of playing the violin well, which I never could learn, uh, are indeed practical tricks you have to learn by observation of those people who are doing it. So not every, although I'm a theorist myself, not everything can be answered by theory. So when to disregard your legitimate fear and when you listen to it, that is a question of conscience, of moral judgment, of intelligence and of luck. And of luck. Simply, oh, good old luck. And this is what I wish you. Next one, your decision. Okay. Huh? <laughs> no, I oh, am. Yeah. Thanks a lot first for the for the talk. Uh, I'm sorry for being maybe a bit simplistic. I'm really out of the topic. But when I think about populism, and even more in my country, which is in Latin America, and in a lot of countries in Latin America, there's two things that come to my mind. Capitalism and fake news nowadays. So how would you relate that? Because at least the situation, what I see maybe in Brazil, in my country, but maybe not that extreme or not that international, and in Venezuela, of course, is part of this two things. So I don't know if you can, you have a mind. I, I, I hope I understand uh, what you're getting at. Uh, well, about fake news, again, uh, when in the Middle Ages uh, it was said that the Jews are poisoning the wells, the water wells, and there are uh, putting the blood of Christian children into their cakes. That wasn't very different, actually, 
and no, it was not even cruder very much than what you what you hear today. And you know when when you hear, for example, Bolsonaro about the indigenous people or about gays, total absolute lies, total impossibilities. Everyone knows that are then disseminated by the uh, media organizations. That is not new. There is a difference, though. When such rumors have been launched in the Middle Ages, nobody was pretending that that was a pluralistic and free society. So, <clears throat> these fake news of today are more dangerous because they appear to be emanating not from a powerful, biased political group, but from a general milieu of self-generating content. And which is partly true, partly untrue, and partly is differently true, namely that people are, by producing fake news and all this poisonous propaganda, are reproducing their own political pathologies of which they are not any longer responsible. They have been induced by a long line of development, of late capitalist development, to be like that, to be looking for explanations for their own unhappiness and their own pathologies and their own sadistic impulses in the usual create, uh, creation of enemy images and so on and so forth. It is not their fault always. Some of it is artificially created, but it wouldn't be ever successful if it wasn't disseminated and continued and amplified by willing, innocent, misled people. And that shows again in what a predicament we are in a society of great technical sophistication, of huge economic resources, of enormous intellectual possibilities and potentialities in sciences and arts and all that, and societies that still suffer, that cannot do anything with these fantastic given riches. And if there's not a crisis, then I cannot recognize the crisis if I see it. So because we are not, for the moment, we are not victims of a world war of a, or, a, or a climactic catastrophe yet. And still we live as though we were. So the, the, the next catastrophe, the next disaster that will be probably ecological is presented to us in advance by our bad faith and our alienation and our inability and unwillingness to recognize and to defend truth. And so I cannot console you. The situation is really terrible. And indeed, the traditional defenses don't hold. Because you see, <clears throat> and that was already the case in the 20s and 30s, I've read a great deal of literature around the creation and the victory of uh, Italian and German fascism. And what is very interesting, that what did optimistic people say then? Listen, they said, it is not possible that such a crude and pagan movement will not be resisted by the churches. Catholicism won't allow Mussolini and Hitler to win. So let's everybody back the Catholic Church, although conservative was still a great popular force, and it will be against this. Then people said that the traditional bourgeoisie won't stand for something as crude and vulgar as national socialism. Others said, well, what, you, what are you talking about? Social democracy and the Communist Party still have the greatest force in our society, the working class. They won't let these people to win because they know perfectly well that they will be put to prison if these other people win. So they will defend at least ourselves, themselves. None of this has come into being, not for a moment, not for a second. So I won't repeat, therefore, this style of, of consolation, 
that this won't go on because people sooner or later will discover that it's intolerable and it's immoral and it's wrong and it's evil. No, no. We have to realize the seriousness of the threat and we'll have to organize against it. Political action can be defeated only by political action. It is, it is not enough to write bitter articles. Okay, I do write bitter articles uh, because I can't do anything else because I know that this is not a moment at least where I live to organize anybody for anything. Because people are resisting that because they're disappointed. They're disenchanted. People lost their illusions. How to tell them to start again after all those terrible disappointments they went through. It is psychologically immensely trying and difficult. All East European countries, including East Germans, we are after one of the greatest disappointments in history, the disappointment after 89. That was, after all, for many people, a hope of a democratic and decent and moderate society. Nothing came of it. They're all being defeated. You know, I was one of the leaders of the 89 movements. Can I tell you that I was right and that we won and everything is okay? No. We have not won and we haven't been right to begin with and this whole thing is a miserable defeat. So, of course, we are after all these disillusionments and disenchantments and it's very difficult to convince ourselves and others that political action should be taken, although it should be taken. I can see two, three, four people. Five. Just, okay. okay. Then, uh, who's the next one? Okay. Then, then we choose the last five. Okay. Then we start there. Hi, thank you. I'm, I want to raise another uh, uh, issue that we didn't talk about today. Um, as you mentioned, and in, at least in my opinion, uh, populists uh, tend to rise in time of uncertainty. Once the people uh, feel fear, and especially ex existential fear. It was in the 20s and also now. And, uh, Maybe one of the triggers, at least in my point of view, is the impact of globalization on the part of the society who lost their jobs or uh, their opportunities that they had. And uh, they see globalization as one of the reasons for it. And they don't feel the positive side of a globalization, but the negative side of it. And this feed the populist with uh, peoples who could be uh, um, their group. Um, there is another change that is coming within the next 20, 30 years maybe, and that is the field of artificial intelligence and automation. A lot of people would lose their jobs because of this, and there would be bigger concerts, concerns with companies with a lot of wealth, and many people with less wealth. You mentioned the um, income inequality that uh, happens right now in Europe and many other places. So my question is, this is an uncertainty, a problem that we see is coming, and we still have maybe 10, 20 years for it. Uh, how can we prevent that next wave of populism that might happen? So I have to keep my replies short because the time is uh, 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 limited. One of the most important and most interesting things at the moment is that actually the neoliberal type of globalization is defeated. We live already in an age of protectionism, of increased state power, of statism, and of chauvinism. There is this line in the development of capitalism that there are periods of free markets, international trade, globalization if you wish, and then retrenchment, uh, withdrawal 
behind the national boundaries. And Trump, again, is a very good example of that. Look at his commercial war against China, which is against all the precepts of globalization. So globalization is already defeated. It's already defeated. Well, not maybe in the you know, the radical way of olden times where people all of a sudden, millions of people uh, were forced to use passports. I don't know whether you knew that before 1914, there were no passports. It didn't exist. Everybody traveled where they wanted. Only the Russians had passports and they, they had to ask for permission to leave Russia. But that was one country in the whole world and there were some restrictions in Japan, but these were exceptions. Usually, people just traveled where they wanted. Uh, you know, my grandfather was a tailor um, in a small town in Transylvania and traveled to Germany and to Holland to learn the trade. And I asked him, you know, because of, you know, being, being born in, in, in 1948, so, and you got all your visas and passports? There were no visas, there were no passports. Nobody asked him to do They asked him to sit down and, you know, cut a shirt. And so, you know, okay, that won't be, that won't be the case that uh, uh, things will be changed like they changed after the First World War, when indeed the first real nation states in our sense were really born. And, uh, but most certainly that globalization era is finished. And uh, I can't even begin to address your interesting question about artificial intelligence and robotization and so on. One thing is certain that uh, actually machinization, that is saving production costs, is a permanent feature of capitalism since it exists. Nothing new about it. Capitalism always wanted to reduce the number of the working people because that means reducing production costs. It is not because capitalists are evil, because that's the logic of capitalist valuation. This is how you create value, by reducing costs and increasing sales. That, of course, is a self-defeating thing, because if you decrease the working force, then, of course, there will be nobody to buy your wares. This is why capitalism is always full of crises. But this, this is you know, elementary Marxist lessons Number one and number two. You all know that, of course. It's just the same thing radicalized. Radicalized. And, you know, when the first spinning jennies were introduced in the uh, English textile industries in the 1820s, uh, the same procedure that we have with artificial intelligence is replacing human brain and human brawn with machines of one kind or another. In our case, terribly intelligent machines. And that, you know, is ending capitalism in a very significant way because those acting beings being exploited won't be human. Won't be human. That's the last point. So, that shows that capitalism and the world that goes with it cannot survive. We know that. We've always known that. Capitalism is a dynamic system that runs towards its fulfillment, its realization, its fantastic triumphs, and its end. It's a historical creature. It's historical in character. It has begun, and it will end. And unlike old agrarian societies that seem to serve some eternal needs. Okay, this will end. And the question is, will this end as the socialist sages have predicted in olden times with a more humane and uh, fairer and juster society, or will it just end in a disaster? And we are, at the moment, running towards a disaster. That's clear. Yes. No doubt about that. That automation and AI will destroy the capitalist economy. Of course, that's obvious. Of course it will. Yes. Certainly. Because, of course, the economy consists also of the workers and of the consumers. 
And if the consumers and the workers are losing their usefulness, what kind of capitalist economy is that? No kind of economy, let alone a capitalist economy. Of course. And so therefore, you know, what has always been the solution in such overproduction crises, as they were called once upon a time? War. War, ladies and gentlemen. That's what has always been offered and we might see it again. Yeah. But without a hope that Kant and Marx had that it can be overcome by an international society of free individuals. Who believes in that? Nobody. Who wants that? Everybody. You know? So that's, that's what, what is very strange in our situation, you see. Uh, I, um, I would shorten it to two more questions because uh, they have to prepare for the movie night afterwards um, and uh, I would give it to one uh, there yep like this, um, in the front yep yeah, and, and, yes okay thank you uh, my name is Daniel Ganyin I'm sorry I'm from Cameroon um I have a question because I, 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 first of all, I want to say I really appreciate your, your, your insight about the populism and politics. Uh, however, uh, I want to find out from you, uh, your personal opinion, what are the factors that you put in place to be able to characterize a politician as being authentic or not authentic? And uh, could it be that uh, the only way to evaluate the a politician is about what they say and what they promises to keep. Because we live in a world today whereby every politician says something and does something else. So how do you characterize a politician who says, I will do this, like um, Duterte says, I'll kill the drug dealers. He killed them. He said he will do this, he did them. And what about a politician who doesn't say he would do these things and he does them? So how do you characterize these things? Not easy, because of course, um, but I'll give you an example. Um, you, you will have guessed by now whom I will now quote. Of course, it's Gandhi. And why do I consider him to, be, to have been an authentic politician? He was not totally innocent. He was no saint. He was a good man, obviously. And he meant what he said, and he did what he... He, he meant what he said, and, and he did then what, what, what he was saying. But, of course, how, did, how was he successful? Because saints are not successful, and he was. He was a good politician and an authentic, authentic politician because he could feel very deeply, this is what I talked when I talked about judgment, he could feel very deeply the needs and the feelings of his Indian people. Especially, he felt something that professional politicians have neglected. Namely, that this was not only a people that had problems, but it was also a people that was humiliated and hurt in its pride. And he has shown this through his own humility that there is something in us that even the strongest power cannot hurt. And by this, he has shown the Indians that actually they were not humiliated. That being defeated doesn't mean that you are inferior. That's just the most wonderful thing. And also he changed morally his generation and also he created a free state. Well, something. I would say that is something. And uh, so such things can happen, you know, with the uh, uh, coincidence of extraordinary talent, of great character, a great soul, and a great deal of luck. You know, so it can happen, but I wouldn't trust, my point is this, just one sentence, I wouldn't trust authentic politician, I would trust 
societies that are continuously producing authentic politicians. Yeah. Uh, one last question that I would like to give to a female person because we um, had like um, half half. That one. Hello, my name is Veronika. I'm from Moldova. And um, I was wondering to ask you how can we uh, fight with fake populism? when populism is actually dividing the country in two and uh, when they are fighting for um, something that we are, uh, we are um, um, when they actually are politically uh, and they are paid and they are fighting for the fake reasons because we have such a problem in my country and it's pretty serious, and I'm, uh, I'm now abroad, but I uh, really want to help, and I don't know how. And also, is there something uh, that can show us uh, this fake thing before the elections? Because all the politicians are, um, all has, this election company and all of them looks very nice and uh, all of them are trying to fight for their country but actually uh, they have this hidden um, hidden uh, yeah, um, reasons and uh, so, uh, sorry for my English <laughs> uh, yeah so how can we fight uh, against this uh, fake rising of populism. Right, I, I'm sorry, probably all populism is fake because that's, its, that's its, its essence and its calling to present things in a light that is false. And you are indeed in, in Moldova in a really terrible fix uh, because you are blessed with, uh, as you say, to the fake politicians whose motives are not shown openly and you know one is for Russia the other is for Romania and not even that is sincere I know I know and uh, you know what can you do yes what can you do is found an extremely good television station that will present news objectively and that is not paid either by Moscow or by Bucharest or by anybody else how I don't know Second, you found a large mass party that shows the Moldovans that all these uh, um, maniacal fixations with Romania and with Moscow and all that is just preventing them from creating a proper democratic society. And again, what I said to, to our friend from, from Gabon, uh, that uh, you must start with a non-ethnic political organization that starts to get rid of all these old fixations with Russia and non-Russia, etc., 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 because you can't live like that. It poisons everything, okay? And, yeah, so f you need ideas and force and money and luck and determination and allies. That's all you need. Otherwise, it's easy. Okay, I would think it was like perfect last statement. So nothing more to say. And well, thank you so yeah. much. And if anybody wants to ask me further questions that uh, weren't voiced, I will be around here so we can talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, thank you once again um, for you being here, for also you being here. Um, we have prepared a small present that uh, Sankalp um, brings on stage. Yeah, th um, 
thank you everybody for being here. Um, as uh, uh, Gaspar said, um, he would be um, here also for further uh, discussions. We maybe can uh, just take a room or something. And uh, yeah, stay critical, stay open, and found your political inventions. Thank you.